Good morning and welcome to our service this morning of August the 18th, 2024. Well, she is going quickly. Um, August still quite quiet in church, although we're preparing for our flower festival and our holiday club, which will be running at the end of the month. That will be a very busy week for us. So our gathering prayer for this morning. Jesus, our living bread, we have an appetite for you and we come wanting to feed on your word. Jesus, you offer life to the world, eternal life, raising us up on the last day, keeping us hungry for you with the anticipation of the feast of the finest food, food that brings life. Amen. And just to say, for those of you who don't know, I'm Sean, I'm one of the church wardens, and I've been in these services now for, oh, I'm into my eighth month. Um, but hopefully, Joe will be taking over very, very soon, so you will have a proper vicar then. So I'm going to start with our reading from John's Gospel, following on really from last week, except the reading this week actually repeats the last verse of sweet reading but it's actually verse 51 it's because we're sort of in the middle of a conversation so it's just trying to get the context right and it's still doing that comparison between Israel when they were in the wilderness waiting for the manna to come down from heaven and the people that were there Jesus and every day as we know that manna bread came and it was just enough for the day uh, they couldn't store it. It would go mouldy and manky and have maggots and things in it. And I do wonder if that's why in our Lord's Prayer, Jesus said, give us our daily bread. We don't know. Anyway, let's have a look at our reading, which is from the Gospel of John, and it will be verse 51 to verse 58. And I think these verses are really at the heart of the way we celebrate Holy Communion. So John chapter 6 and starting at verse 51. I am the living bread, came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Then the Jews began to argue sharply among themselves. <coughs> How can this man give us his flesh to eat? And Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your forefathers ate manna and died. But he who feeds on this bread will live forever. This is the word of our Lord. Amen. I thought I'd move on before I sort of come to the little homily um, to, I suppose, a little meditation I found. Imagining a day in the life of Peter. So I'm going to be pretend to be here. Eating flesh and drinking blood. Ugh. Peter is confused. And he has other things on his mind as well. Well, it turned me right off my dinner, I can tell you. All that talk about eating flesh and drinking blood. Oh, thinking, Nick, what did he have to do that for? Just on dinner time as well. You know, sometimes worry about Jesus. Why does he have to keep talking in riddles? I was really embarrassed too, especially when my neighbour came up and said to me, 
he thought Jesus was potty. Tell me, he said, with a grin as wide as the Jordan on his face, how do you interpret the rabbi's words? Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me and I in them. I didn't know what to say. Just mumbled something about, you think you meant? Turning the question round like that, I thought I was being quite clever. But see, though, he wasn't impressed with my reply. So he just laughed and he went off saying, you haven't got a clue, have you? Stick to your fishing, Peter. Got a bit of a prune. Makes us look as though we don't know what we're doing. You sometimes, I wonder if we do. And I'm not the only one that's confused either. Although I sometimes think I'm the only one who seems to ask any questions. Oh well, I decided it was time for a bite to eat. So I went off to find my wife. Truth is, I wanted to see Reuben. I haven't told you about him, have I? Reuben is our son. Just a few weeks old and the apple of his father's eye. Just loving to bits. So beautiful I could eat him up, if you know what I mean. My wife says I've gone really soppy over him, laughing and dancing round the room with him, pretending to gobble him up. She does it too. I've seen her. Something just happened to me when I first held him in my hands, so small, so vulnerable, so wonderfully made. Flesh of my flesh, bone of my bone, and blood of my blood, containing my seed of life in his little body. I'm so consumed with love for him. But I also have a mixture of feelings when I hold him close. Fear and joy, concern and responsibility. Somehow I just want to keep him by me, protect him, provide for him. My son Reuben and me. It's a special relationship, father and his child. So, I mean, it's hardly surprising, really, that what Jesus is saying here is it's neither understood nor appreciated. Repeated use of that word flesh in this passage only goes to emphasise the distasteful suggestion of eating a dead carcass and somehow associating this with the living man in relation to God. The Jews in John's uh, gospel get a bad press. He uses this phrase actually quite often simply to mean the leaders or the chief priests and the Pharisees and the scribes, particularly those who oppose Jesus. This may some say something about relations between the emerging Christian community in which John's gospel was written and the local synagogue. You might consider the way historically, especially in the 20th century, this has been used to justify the most vicious anti-Semitism. Consider also the way we tend to homogenize other populations. You know, for example, we might refer to the homeless or the immigrants or the disabled or the elderly and so on. So I'd like to move us on now to our little homily this week, obviously based on that reading. Well, at the moment, thanks to the lectionary, we seem to be in a bit of a bread fest. All of our recent gospel readings seem to have focused on bread. Three weeks ago, we heard about the feeding of the 5,000. John 6, 1 to 21. Two weeks ago, Jesus made first statement about I'm the bread of life. Still in John chapter 6, this time verses 24 to 35. And last week, again, Jesus said he's the bread of life. It's in John 6, verses 41 to 51. And this morning, Jesus makes the statement that I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Personally, I love making bread. I love the way the sort of Dough ingredients, the flour, the water, yeast, and possibly a bit of fat all come together to make a dough that becomes more and more pliable as you work it. I particularly love eating warm, fresh bread smothered with butter. Mm, not worried about the cholesterol at that point. Bread is such a satisfying food across so much of the world in one form or another. Perhaps that is why God uses it, both in fact and as an image every so often. Well, there are several mentions in the Bible of God feeding and satisfying his people. The 
traffic back to the Israelites fleeing from Egypt. No food and were hungry. Would arrange for manna, bread of heaven, be provided each morning, fresh, just enough for them to be satisfied. Specifically, a simple, wholesome, satisfying food, rather than something more exotic or complicated. And when Elijah was starving and looking for food, he asked a widow for some bread, but she had none to give him, and hardly any ingredients remaining either. And God provided her with flour and oil, so that she could bake bread and keep baking it. it seemed fancy, simply the ingredients to produce something that was really satisfying. And as we know, Jesus fed 5,000 hungry people with five small barley loaves and two fish. There's also an account of him feeding 4,000 men, plus women and children, with seven small loaves and a few fish. It's in Matthew's Gospel. However, in all of these accounts, the people concerned always become hungry again, just as we do after we've eaten. It is important to keep this in mind as we, re we reflect on why he might have made the claim to be the living bread that came down from heaven and that whoever eats this bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give you for the life of the world is my flesh. This acts to show us that God is not only interested in our physical needs, he also cares for our spiritual and our mental needs. John's Gospel actually doesn't mention the Last Supper, which is in the other three Gospels, as well as Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. But it is a key event that is recreated in many church ceremonies in the form of the Eucharist. Every time we take communion, we are encouraged to think about Jesus as the bread and the wine of eternal life. The phrase that people needed to eat of the living bread challenged those around Jesus as they took his words literally. <laughs> they eat the living flesh of a man and keep on eating him and gain eternal life. It just didn't make sense. This was such a difficult concept for people to hear. Many disciples and followers found it so hard, they turned away from Jesus. There is also a statement that churches have struggled with over the centuries. Are the bread and wine used in the Eucharist really transformed into the body and blood of Jesus? Or are they symbolic? They're to remind us of Jesus and his words. Perhaps we need to think a little bit more laterally rather than literally about what's happening in this reading. Various images might come to mind. Can, sorry, we can all be satisfied by the eating of bread. It doesn't stop us from getting hungry again later on. If Jesus can be seen as the bread of life when we eat, we should also reflect on Jesus and his words and give thanks. The heavenly bread that he offers us is bread that will nourish us spiritually and keep us alive. Because the bread we consume with him is really the word of God. Consuming the word of God should come as naturally to us as eating. When we eat, we should reflect on God, his provision for us, and thank him. There is another phrase actually used about Jesus. At the beginning of his gospel, John makes the statement, and the word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. Jesus is the word as well as the living bread. We could turn the term around and call him the bread of life. The word is that life-giving bread. There are people in our world who eat to live. They eat when they need to and are simply taking on calories. Eating fulfills a purpose and they don't need to reflect on or think about that. And there are people who to eat. They think about and plan their food with care and thought and take pleasure from the experience. I wonder if that's what we're being encouraged to do here. To 
focus on the word of God in the form of Jesus Christ and to be blessed by that experience, dearly, just as often as we need to eat. Reflecting on God's purpose for our lives and the blessings we receive from Jesus become as natural as eating is to us. Just as we might eat and digest our bread, so too should we read and listen in will he digest the word of God. Interesting, one of the Psalms that I haven't read set for today was Psalm 34. And verse 8 in this psalm starts with, O taste and see that the Lord is good. Happy are those who take refuge in him. This morning, I'd encourage you to taste and see that the Lord is good. Amen. So let us come together now in prayer and still our thoughts and come to our Lord God. He's always there and always listening. Not always replying. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have our well-being in your hand. We thank you for guiding us through the good times and the bad. Teach us to rest in your love and compassion. Refresh us when we falter or fail. Smile with us when we succeed in your name. Help us to care for and support each other. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving Father, we pray for your church here on earth. Thank you for the blessings that bind us all together and to pray for guidance through the issues that threaten to tear us apart. In difficult times, we pray that the church will enjoy rest and refreshment so that it can continue its work in your name. We pray for all ministers, both lay and ordained. and We pray for everyone who forms part of our church life. And we pray particularly the people whose lives are endangered just by speaking or simply reading your word. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Creator God, you made a beautiful world for us to live in. Help us to care for and sustain it, rather than simply using and abusing it. Pray for wisdom and honesty in our world. The leaders and people in positions of authority, those who make decisions that affect so many lives. We pray here in the UK for King Charles and Queen Camilla. We pray for our government, that the decisions they will make will be for the well-being of the country. Lord, in your mercy, hear. Loving God, we pray for our communities, people of all ages, young and old. We pray for young people as they consider their futures, whether in education or work. We thank you for the caring services and lift up people who may be ill in body, mind or spirit, and the people who love and care for them, both paid and unpaid. We pray for people who might be struggling due to circumstances beyond their control. And we particularly pray for people who might be struggling behind closed doors. We ask that there will be someone there to help. Lord, in your mercy, hear prayer. And finally, we pray for people who are coming to the end of their lives on earth particularly those for whom today will be their last day. We ask that you will welcome them into your loving arms. We pray also for people who grieve, whether that grief is new and fresh, or older and suddenly sharp and painful. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful Father, Accept our prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. 
Amen. Let's just join together now in saying prayer that Jesus himself taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. So just to finish in conclusion, I think there are some things in the Bible and at the centre of our faith can be difficult to grasp and even harder to communicate. I think John 6, the Gospel reading today, is one of them. With Jesus linking the bread he gives with his flesh and asserts that those who eat his flesh and drink his blood will have eternal life. That natural flow of blood round our body gives us life. It distributes the nutrients and we use oxygen in every part, enabling it to function. And Jesus wants to be that close to us, part of our very being, supporting and empowering us. We can appreciate the gift of a blood transfusion for medical purposes. By his death and resurrection, Jesus makes the offer his life flowing within us eternal life. We also understand in our modern society, many devices need charging up and electrical vehicles can travel many miles without noise or pollution. But eventually, they need to return to their source of power to be recharged. What are we enabled to do when we're plugged into Jesus? I think also sometimes on our Seen this in books, modern humanity can be rather put off by the sort of cannibalistic implications of drinking someone's blood and eating their body. But actually, we use those metaphors a lot when we talk about people being consumed by passion, eaten up with jealousy, devouring ideas. Even in the little meditation with Peter, he was doing the same, going around with him, gobbling up his son and all those sorts of things where we do use those analogies. Well, the bread actually recalls Christ's fleshly life in its very ordinariness. Blood is the image of its enduring and special deep life, in which the believer is invited to share, not just via ritual, but all the time. How can we talk about this in a way that people in our community are going to understand? Does it help to link this passage to the start of John's Gospel, chapter 1, with a focus on the word becoming flesh and living among us? Perhaps Jesus is actually talking less about communion here and more about the meaning of incarnation. So what do you think? Or pondering. So as you move into the coming week, I hope that God is alongside you, that he blesses you in your endeavours. God willing, we will be here together on the 25th of August. So may God make you wise in your understanding, bold in your proclaiming, generous in your sharing, humble in your receiving, and loving to those who are at your table. Amen. So God bless you and God willing, I will be with you next week. Amen. Thank you.